Um, so just, just quickly by way of background, my background is actually in nursing. Um, and so I have worked across the healthcare arena. My colleagues at the National Council, when we were all together last month, I've been there almost three years, they said, you worked in an intensive care unit? And I said, yeah, that was when I was dumb and young. <laughs> um, but I did do that for five years to prove to myself I could be a real nurse. If you're interested, I can tell you more about why I had to do that. Um, but what I've done, I've been working with the National Council for the last three years and have really had the opportunity um, to <laughs> do what I, what I said I wanted to do when I accepted the position there, which was to learn more about how healthcare works across the country. And sometimes you need to be careful what you ask for because across the country has been even more than I anticipated when I started. But So I really want to kind of bring that perspective. And I think this is a really critical time for us in healthcare because I'm assuming all of you work in some aspect of healthcare. Is that true? Anybody here who doesn't work in some aspect of healthcare? Okay. And how many of you would identify yourselves as primarily working in the behavioral health space? Okay. And how many of you would identify yourselves as working primarily in the primary care or physical health space? Okay, now there's about um, more than a third of you who didn't raise your hand. So you work in healthcare. How about integrated care? Does that get more of you to raise your hand? No. So for the, somebody who hasn't raised your hand, where do you work? Public health. Public health. And you don't consider that physical health. You can public health as a, was it you who said that? Yeah. So what's your role there? My role? Yeah. Um, it's doing outreach to people to, to a, a group or a community of people okay. to improve their health. Okay, so you're really working with the whole community's overall health from that, that public and health. And it, and it breaks down to the individuals. It does, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. What's, do, are you a community health worker? Or are you no, a, I supervise outreach community health workers. Okay, great. Great. For a health system. Okay. How about the rest of you? Anybody else want to tell me sort of what makes you not fit into? So let's say we've got a third category of public health. How many of you would that capture? A few more. There's still a few I haven't identified. Anybody else? Any other? Yeah. Okay, so, so you said you're working with a rural ACO, the development of a rural ACO, and one of your cornerstones, you didn't use the word cornerstone, but I'm interpreting that. I wish I would have. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that's what you meant, yeah. is to bring together physical and behavioral health. And again, I think when we're thinking about those large system development projects, thinking about you know, you've got to think about so many things on the, on the sort of structural level around financing and regulation, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have to get down to the level of then who serves people? And how do we right size service? And how do we provide population based care? And how do we provide stepped care? And I think this conversation today really is very germane to that. So glad you're here. Anybody else? Yeah. Education. Education. How many of you are educators? I should say educators by payment structure. All of us, I believe, are educators, but by payment structure. Okay. And do you want to just say a little bit about, I know, I know what you do, but. I'm one of the instructors for the community health certificate program at, at the community colleges in Minnesota. Okay. And would, would the, so you're one of the instructors for the educational programs for the community health workers here in Minnesota. Would that be something similar to your education? Different education. She's shaking her head, no, no, no. I, I work Life Tag, which is a nonprofit based here in St. Paul. So we do therapeutic, preschool, and Huntington's programs as well as working with immigrant and refugee populations. So we are uh, looking at ways to integrate a CHW into our programs. Okay. To really focus on that health base. <coughs> Okay, so you're doing early intervention with children, preschoolers, mm -hmm. even earlier? Even earlier. Even earlier. Okay, that such important, important work. If we can help kids early, it can make, I mean, I know we all know that, but I just have this growing with all the research that's coming out about adverse childhood experiences and physical health. It's just what you do is so important. 
Um, and you're looking at how you can incorporate a community health worker. Okay, great. All right. So that's kind of who's in the room, and this should be a very rich conversation. So again, feel free to interrupt me if something I say doesn't make sense or you're, I use jargon that doesn't make sense. Um, please interrupt me. Or the other thing I can promise you I will do is I'll say something that doesn't quite fit here in Minnesota, okay? or I'll, I'll not get a nuance that's true here in Minnesota because one of the things I've learned about healthcare in this country is it doesn't matter if it's the same federal money. When it flows down, it goes in different ways. So feel free to sort of say, but I don't get how that would work here, okay? So having said that, we had this um, discussion about future opportunities, future possibilities. All right, and I think where you are in Minnesota is there are a lot of opportunities here for community health workers in terms of their inclusion in behavioral health, in terms of their inclusion on multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary teams. But I also would like you to add the word possibility to that slide because where I see us being in healthcare right now is needing to continue to move, and I'm often working with, with systems around this. I do a lot of state level work and a lot of provider level work and facilitate lots of learning communities, both state level and you know we've got providers from all across the country in a particular learning community. And one of the things I keep hearing us moving toward is rather than being what I would consider a reflexive system, meaning tell me what to do and I'll do it. I'm not going to do anything until you tell me what to do, okay? Those of us who are still in that mode, that's not going to work. Or I should say, you can try it, but I think because there's so much chaos right now, there's also tremendous opportunity to think out of the box and to begin to say, but what if we tried this? and to begin to engage payers and regulators in that dialogue. And so that's why I want to include that word possibility. So what are some of those trends that I think are really big picture? And a lot of this is preaching to the choir, but I think it's helpful. To me, my, my sister-in-law is an artist. And until I knew her, I didn't understand how paintings come to be. And I just thought you'd get a canvas and then you start painting on it, right? Anybody in here a painter? Okay, so when you get a canvas, first you cover the whole canvas with white paint, okay? And then you begin to go back and fill in the lines. So this is kind of the white paint on the canvas, all right? So where are we at? We've got some of the highest healthcare spending per capita of anywhere in the world, okay? Three years ago it was about $8,000 per person. But we're behind in almost every health measure, infant mortality, life expectancy, high cost, poor quality, okay? I was very struck as I was sort of, um, I never can hold statistics in my head, so I had to go back and get some of them. In terms of life expectancy, we're 38th among developed nations. And you know who 36 and 37 are? This is very striking to me. Uh, Cuba and Chile, okay? So we're behind Cuba and Chile in terms of life expectancy. So why is that? Poor quality, inefficient care, okay? And when I talk about inefficient care, I'm talking about care that is given without consideration of who is the best person to provide this particular intervention at this particular time to this particular person, okay? And I think we have to start asking what feels like a very micro question. And as we ask that question, the role of community health workers, peer support staff on the mental health side and recovery specialists on um, the substance use disorder side begins to emerge as something that makes a lot of sense. Not just because we can pay them less, but because they can deliver a different kind of care when we think about matching those things. So those are kind of, to me, and we've got, of course, an aging population. I'm sure none of you in this room feel that, personally. Um, but we've got this aging population. 
We have an increasingly diverse population, and I think we've only begun to scratch the surface of what that really means for us in terms of a delivery system. And we've got, a, when you think about the increasing need that will come with an aging population, obviously we don't have a workforce to meet that need. Again, another reason to begin to look at developing high functioning interdisciplinary teams that are built on maybe people we have not thought about before in our workforce. So those are kind of the, what I call the uh, depressing things. Where I start to see innovation, and we've got a great example right here, is there are some very cool things going on around the country with accountable care organizations who are beginning to say, what is it that our community really needs? Yes, the initial driver is rehospitalization and cost, but very quickly in the really innovative ones, and I'm thinking particularly Montefiore in New York City has had an ACO for about the last three and a half years. And they have really started to think about sort of their community. They've brought behavioral health providers to the table as part of their ACO. And they're doing some really innovative work. Now, having been through what I've been through in the last four months around community health workers, I plan to have a conversation with Henry Chung, who's one of the leaders of that ACO, to say, oh, what are you thinking about community health workers? Because I'm not sure they're doing anything with them. But they're really starting to ask some different questions and deliver some different kinds of um, services that make sense. Got a lot of, yeah. Um, if you check the National Public Radio's you know, archive from, I believe it was last week, they were talking about community health workers in New York City delivering care. Yeah. I don't know if it was Montefiore or not. It's not at Montefiore. I know where it is, and now the name escapes me. I just read this again last night. But it's not at Montefiore, but New York City does have a huge. It was a great um, expose or, uh, you know, dive into CH worker, uh, CHWs and what they can do. This was on community. All Things Considered, or? I don't remember what. It, it was during a drive time, morning or afternoon, who morning knows? Morning or afternoon, yeah, yeah. <laughs> who, who knows, but you can archive, you yeah. know, check the archives. Great. Yeah, New York City has had a lot of development around it. I'm just not sure whether in this particular ACO they're thinking yeah. about and it. And I, I can't tell you who, yeah. who was. But that's an example, right, of how we start to think a little differently if we think about quality, efficiency, and what I would call cultural humility. Um, because I don't know that cultural competence is actually a really helpful term for us anymore. I think cultural humility is a much better term because none of us will ever know about all cultures. But if we think about those things, then we begin to think and ask different questions. So we've also got this really interesting thing going on across the country. One of the recurring themes that's coming up in every learning community we're running is this issue of what does our service actually cost and what does that price buy? So this connection between cost and outcome, again, I went kicking and screaming into this conversation. If, my, if Kathy Reynolds, our Vice President of Integration, was here, she would laugh because she knows that costing is not my favorite part of life. I'm not, that's not where I'm wired. But what I'm beginning to see is as we start to ask those questions, again, it drives us to ask different questions about our practice. Because if I was with an organization a couple weeks ago, they did a workflow, they did all of the linking all the codes to their costs, and they're doing a three-hour intake okay, process. Now, first of all, imagine being the person going through that three-hour nightmare. But second, they can't afford to do a three-hour intake. And so one of the things we were backing into is, who, how do you want to right-size your staff? Okay, Again, that's a place where you begin to say, around engagement, would it make sense to include staff who happen to be particularly skilled at engagement, community health workers, peer support staff, depending on the context. Okay, just another example. And then health homes. And I understand here in Minnesota you've had sort of, one, okay, this is where I'm going to get tripped up, but on one kind of health home, but now you're working on the development of behavioral health homes. And in that development of behavioral health homes, 
You, unlike many of the states I'm working with around health home implementation, are thinking about what is the role of a community health worker in a behavioral health home. And we'll talk more about that, but let me just say quickly, one of the recurring themes I get on coaching calls with organizations that are bringing up health homes is they'll say to me, we got this. We trained our staff in chronic disease, our, our behavioral health staff, okay? We taught them about diabetes. We taught them about hypertension. We taught them about the need to connect people with primary care. And we're doing okay with that. But then they forget that they have to engage people in a relationship and work with people on the behavioral health end. So then we try to help them get that going and they forget about the chronic disease, the physical. Because that, and I think this is kind of where we are as a field, we aren't, we haven't really figured out within the bodies of the people working in this field very well how to keep that integration going. And I think in that conversation, a community health worker, and I heard that from people as I talked to people across the country who are using community health workers on interdisciplinary teams in behavioral health organizations. The community health worker keeps that voice in the room about, yes, but they have diabetes. And it doesn't work to tell this person who is Hispanic by descent, Mexican by country of origin, that you need to cut carbohydrates in your diet, okay? That doesn't get us there. And they can kind of bring that whole different perspective around how can we work with that issue. So that's just another example of a place where in behavioral health homes we're beginning to see that emerge. And, but I think the role there is to continue to be that voice in the room as well as then to deliver services. So it's kind of a, a double role. Um, so the other thing we know, and again, keep this in mind as the white on our, on our uh, canvas, we know what works. We're beginning to see some things that work. And I mentioned one of them, interdisciplinary teams. Are, we, gotta, we cannot be in this solo practitioner mode. It's not gonna get us across the finish line. Interdisciplinary teams in primary care, interdisciplinary teams in behavioral health, interdisciplinary teams across specialties, okay? Integration. Okay, and what I mean by integration, when I'm talking about integration, I'm talking about a different service delivery model. Because I think when we're thinking about the conceptual shift we need to make, it's a whole health and wellness approach. Bringing together primary care and behavioral health in an integrated system of care is one way to deliver that service. But what we know is that when those two things are either in the same space, ideally, or intentionally connected to each other, because I don't think they can always be in the same space, people do better. When you are at your sickest, it is not the time to be your own case manager, okay? Or when you're a family member supporting someone who is sick, it's not the time to be asked to be your own manager, to coordinate your care. And an integrated system that includes a care coordination, care management component can help to improve outcomes because it attends to those things and supports families, helps them navigate the system. Um, and then the other thing is, I think, the community, the whole area of community consciousness. And what I mean by that is some of the, you know, at the National Council, we've got, some of our members have been working in an integrated way for years now. And what we begin to see emerge from people who are what I would call advanced learners are two questions. One is, how do we transform our whole organizational culture to this whole health and wellness approach? And the second is, we have to re-engage the community in a new way because we're only as healthy as the communities in which we live. And so the whole concept of, you know, when I was working with, um, more with recovery transformation at a system level, we talked about it in terms of community recovery. And I think our public health friends have always talked about the health of the community. Now I think we're talking about it with, in terms of community wellness. 
What does, how do we support the community in being well? And again, think about a community health worker, okay? They're the ambassador between the community and your organization and between the community and your team. They come from the community. They get the community in ways that those of us who drive in and work never will. I, I'm in D.C. once a month, okay, I know it's my organization's there, but I'm only in the office. I don't know anything about the D.C. context. But Rose, who is one of the staff in the Center for Integrated Health Solutions, who's also a community health worker, you better believe she gets the context of the part of D.C. she lives and works in, okay? And I think, again, that's a place where community health workers can really be important. So that's kind of big picture. The other thing I touched on a minute ago, you know, this whole idea of community health workers as a culturally conscious voice for integrated care. I did a webinar a couple weeks ago for the National Council on Community Health Workers, and our wonderful communications department looked at kind of what I had planned, and they came back with this title. And I said, oh, this is why I love people who work in communications, because they take my chaos and straighten it out into something pithy. But the reason I'm saying this, I was so, I'm on a real learning curve here in this whole arena of community health workers. On the one hand, it's going back to the future for me because I worked as a visiting nurse in North Philadelphia in my 20s and 30s. North Philadelphia is a very poor part of the city. Um, I was out there in the community all the time. So, and encountered community health workers, which I had completely, of course, forgotten until I dug back into this. But last, in October, I was in New Mexico twice to do, to do our version of um, our contribution, our attempted contribution to the community health worker world, which is this behavioral health training I'll talk more about. And I was very struck. I was, I was in Gallup, New Mexico. Have any of you been in Gallup? Yeah, so I'm looking out at the mountains while I'm doing my training. I mean, what a day. But, you know, I was working with seven women from the Navajo Nation who are community health representatives. And as I sat and listened to them for two days talk to me about their work in behavioral health, what was stunning to me, and I, you know, it's one of those things, you know how you know things in your frontal lobe, but you don't really know things in your gut until you hear the stories. These women are out there doing direct care, intervention in behavioral health with no backup, no training, and no support, okay? N New Mexico's had a lot of chaos in their behavioral health system. I won't get into that, but what really struck me is even in spite of that, most of what they were telling me, they were doing the right thing. And they had an understanding of, a lot of what we did for the two days in the training was to talk about, okay, so, this is how we define depression, okay? This is how we call it. And then what does that really mean in the Navajo Nation? And how can you intervene in the Navajo Nation? How do you talk about suicide in a culture that believes if you talk about death, it invites it, okay? That pushed my thinking, and I'm telling you, those women are just, I, I continue to live with those questions as I work with this material and as I think about why we would think about incorporating community health workers in our teams. I, I'm very, I started out the day, but the, the first training, I said, look, I'm a white girl from Western New York who's lived in Philadelphia area for, for the last almost 30 years. I don't know your world. I know my world, so let's figure out how we can help these two worlds meet. And I think that's what community health workers bring to us. And because I'm always working with organizations, behavioral health organizations, around issues that we call no-shows, okay, it only continues to punctuate for me the critical nature of this issue. How do we develop services or professional or, or a workforce that helps us keep culture in the front of our minds, okay? And I think the community health worker workforce can help us with that. They're not the only people, but I think they can help us with that. 
And as I work with organizations around no-shows, it isn't always a mismatch. There's lots of reasons why people don't engage and don't come back. But there also is a lot of culture in play that we don't recognize. Okay, and so I really think that's a place where um, community health workers can help us. So, okay, now I did it wrong. There. All right. So when we think about what is a community health worker, we've got this great definition here from HRSA. Um, and I, I'm just going to pick out a couple things from here. Lay members of communities who work either for pay or as volunteers. And it's interesting, it's been interesting to me as I've gotten more and more into the literature around community health workers, how much the issues confronting this workforce run parallel to the issues confronting the workforce of peer support specialists. Peer support specialists, for those of you who aren't from the behavioral health world, are people who have a lived experience of a behavioral health issue, who have received some level of training, and then are brought into behavioral health organizations to support other people who are on the road they have been on, okay? And there often is this conversation about, well, why can't we just have them volunteer, okay? I don't know about all the rest of you. I'm all about volunteering, but I need a paycheck, okay? I need to be able to pay my bills. And I think we have that same issue with community health workers. There's all sorts of reasons why we want people to give back to their communities, us included. It helps us. We're healthier when we're giving back. But we can't ask people to do that instead of payment. So the whole, there's one issue. So um, the second piece here, share ethnicity, language, socioeconomic status, and life experiences with the community members they serve. Okay, again, it's that, so for community health workers, it's a different kind of lived experience. It's the lived experience of being a woman in a Navajo tribe. It's the lived experience of being a woman of Hispanic descent, or a man who has also immigrated from Mexico, or my cab driver last night immigrated four years ago here from Ethiopia. You know, it's that whole kind of, I get, I get the atmospherics, okay? Um, and this inter in interpretation, translation, culturally appropriate health education, informal counseling and guidance, um, and direct services. So again, if you think back to what I said earlier in the beginning about where are we lacking in the system right now, the whole area of chronic disease management is embedded in what community health workers can do. The whole area of engagement and helping people navigate the system is embedded in what community health workers do. Oh, I have so much trouble with this. And the World Health Organization, I really liked this quote because I think in some ways this is probably partly aspirational because once we get into a system, in order for this workforce to really take off, we're gonna to have to figure out some kind of certification. We're gonna to have to figure out a payment mechanism, okay? And therefore, there comes a certain level of professionalism. But I think the aspirational piece of this is members of the communities where they work selected by the communities, okay? Now, if someone comes to work in, let's say, in a primary care setting, obviously the selection of that person is going to be made by the primary care provider, whoever hires people. But if I were that primary care provider, I'd be looking for someone who has informal power in the community they're going to be serving, okay? To hold to that aspirational kind of, um, statement and answerable to the community for their activities, I think for me that means that as with all of us, community health workers get feedback in real time about the connection they're making or not making. I'm going to talk in a little bit about um, a study that was done in Wisconsin using, using what they called health educators in a primary care setting to do screening and brief intervention. And one of the interesting things was when they looked at 
Therapeutic Alliance. The Therapeutic Alliance scores of the health educators who were bachelor's level and were more likely to have come from the community were higher than the people who had more training. Okay, again, I think that has something to do with this. So for me, I know that we've got to do, you know, we've got to do the regulatory work, we've got to do the credentialing work, and the Community Health Workers Alliance is doing such a great job with that here in Minnesota. But I think we also want to hold the aspirational piece of this in front of us as we engage community health workers in our systems, because this is where the power of the community health worker lies. Okay, so when we think about the um, community health worker since the ACA, so there is provision in the Accountable Care Act for the use of community health workers. However, since as of May at least, nobody had filed a state plan amendment to include community health workers in their Medicaid reimbursable services, okay? There are states that are considering doing that there are states who have partial payments, like Minnesota is one of them, for specific services. But under the Affordable Care Act, with the open, open, in a sense, open door that is available, nobody has moved forward with that. But there are places, as we talked about, with using um, community health workers in health homes and other innovative ways. I've sort of circled around this, but I want to just take a moment here. You know. There was a time in healthcare, some of you might be old enough to remember this. Are there any other nurses in the room? Am I the only one? All right. Oh, and you're, well, I won't guess how old you are, but <laughs> <laughs> you might be a little close to my age. Is that fair? I'm 57. Are you a little close to my age? Okay. Remember when we were, let me check this out, okay? So I was, in, I was in college to become a nurse from 1975 to 1979. And remember how we were trained to sort of think about the interpersonal role of the nurse? Yes, are you nodding your heads? I remember I had to stand up and give my chair to a doctor. Oh, that too. Oh, me too. That Did you have to do that too? Yeah. That was not. But I'm not talking about that. No, I'm not. <laughs> Joan, I'm going to have you take the mic oh, and then you can engage. <laughs> but, but did you have to do things like process recordings to talk about kind of when you were talking to somebody so to make sure that your communication was helpful? Did you have to work on communication? Maybe my nursing program was weird. I don't remember recordings, but we did a lot of training and listening and yeah. therapeutic communication, yep. I think we called it. Exactly, exactly. And would you agree with that? Yeah. So, and I know that some of you probably, yeah. Wait a minute, I have to do the, the Phil Donahue. You're not old enough to remember Phil Donahue, but I have to do the Phil Donahue thing. I'm a current nursing student. We still do that stuff. Do you still yep. do that stuff? Where are you in school? Bethel University. God bless you, because I can tell you that one of the big discussions in the American Psychiatric Nurses Association is how little content there is around that now. The reason I'm highlighting that as an example is because I think in so many disciplines that at one point had more of a whole health holistic approach, we've, we've done some splitting out of that. And part of what, you know, as the National Council is sort of thinking about our, our members, behavioral health organizations, federally qualified health centers, um, substance use providers, what we're trying to think about in this whole community health worker realm is let's not make the same mistake. Because what we see, and this is what I'm trying to show in my poor little PowerPoint here, which is not probably the best visual, but community health workers certified peer specialists and recovery specialists have in common, and I would add to this family support specialists. Okay, so family members who have had the experience of having a child with challenges or having um, an adult child with challenges, they have in common this lived experience, different lived experience, this experience of knowing the community from which they come. So for someone with a lived experience of a mental illness, they belong to a physical community. They also become, be, belong to a community of people who have had the experience of being othered because of a diagnostic label. 
And so they bring that lived experience to their work. And recovery support specialists, people who are in long-term recovery from substance use disorders, bring not only their geographic community, but their lived experience and the community of others who have supported them in their recovery process, which is usually other people who have had those issues. And that combination of things is what, again, that's sort of, to me, that's the center of the power of this workforce. And as I sort of, what I did about two months ago was I threw a question out on our national listserv and I said, are any of you working with community health workers and behavioral health organizations? And I'll share a couple example stories in a minute, but what I got back was some beautiful examples of organizations that have all three of these kinds of staff on staff and are creating one organization in San Jose, California talks about this as their peer partner team, okay? And they're recognizing that they need all three, that there's a tremendous complementarity in these roles, and that if they can help these three perspectives work together, they develop a real ability to shift and move with the people they're serving in terms of whatever need is pressing them. So I just want you to kind of think that, keep that in mind as we move forward. So just a few um, sort of structural things. So we've got 15 states and the District of Columbia that have, have at the legislative level begun to address the in infrastructure that I said a little while ago would have to develop, right? So we've got to think about role definition, workforce, financing. So there's, there's the beginning of movement. Minnesota is one of the leaders in this. Um, and then if we look here, so in the next 10 years, we need to see at least, and I think this is really conservative, a 28% increase, okay? In the workforce, they're calling social and human services, human service assistance. That would be community health workers, peer support staff. That would also include people like nurses' aides, home health aides who provide physical, like actually hands-on physical services. But these professionals are earning about $28,000 a year, okay? Which is not great, in case you didn't know. Now, I was reading last night on the plane, I was kind of going back through all my reading, and I was reminded in Ohio, there's a project, and I don't know, Joan, and this is one of the resources I need to send to you, but where they set a base salary for their community health workers, and then they did some productivity bonuses and incentives around outcomes, which I thought was a really creative, um, in this case, it was around every time a community health worker had a mom who delivered um, a baby of normal birth weight, they got a $450 bonus. Um, because this particular group was really trying to target that, that group of, you know, that prenatal care and how important it is. Every time the mom showed up for her first prenatal appointment, there was a, a $35 bonus, something like that. So I think there's a lot of ways we can work with um, that salary issue, but it is, it is going to be an issue for us in terms of developing. If you hire somebody who's really skilled, they're going to want to grow and develop, just like all of us do. So we've got um, seven states with some Medicaid reimbursement. Nobody has yet, no state has yet required community health worker coverage by private insurers. This is mostly in your packet just for information. So if you think about it, in order to move this workforce forward, we really need, there are these steps that need to happen, not necessarily in sequence, but um, so if you think about it, you got to have an advisory body, right? You in Minnesota, so in New Mexico, for example, they've got that. You've got to define a scope of practice. You have to have a certification training or process. Interesting, you're one of only four states that has required certification. That's a huge accomplishment. Um, and a standard curriculum, and then reimbursement. You see people are authorizing it, and again, that's only for in all these states, that's only for specific things. It's not for, here is the reimbursement for the whole role of the community health worker. Not a good or bad, just different. 
and then the beginning of incorporating, integrating the community health worker into team-based care. Couple, there's lots of back and forth when you sort of dig into the literature about, as is true of every emerging profession, how do you know that it's the intervention of the community health worker that saved the money? Okay, and so for me, there's this question of at what point do we require evidence-based practice, which is, you know, randomized control trials, control group, experimental group, or practice-based evidence? Okay, you're like that, don't you? Because <laughs> we know a lot of stuff before somebody gets the money to do a randomized control trial, and often you can't get a randomized control trial started on something that's really, really important. It seems to me, that's just my editorial comment, but anyway. So when we think about this, so Christus Health, this is just two examples. Um, when they invested in community health workers to work in a primarily Latino community, okay, around issues of prenatal health and chronic disease management, okay, they saw $16 come back for every dollar they spent on the community health worker salary. Again, small project, not a randomized control trial. Researchers could probably poke holes in it, but it looks like it's heading in that direction. Arkansas, same thing. They saw a 24% annual reduction in the Medicaid spending, and what that looks like is things like emergency room visits, hospitalizations, when they use community health workers, okay? So, couple examples, and then when we think about where are we at with education, so 50% of employers have educational or training requirements, 21% high school diploma or GED, and 32% of employers bachelor's degree. Lots of discussion about what do we really want the entry point to be, and do we really I don't know the answer to this, so I'm just going to throw it out. Do we really want to require a bachelor's degree? Or can we learn something from other peer workforces around life education versus formal education? Because I think if we're going to require a bachelor's degree, that's going to pretty shrink the pool of potential applicants pretty drastically. Don't hear me as being anti-education, I'm not. But I just think in terms of the development of where we're at, as we define the role, does it really require a bachelor's degree as a starting point? Okay. And this has been one of the other, and you know, when I was talking to the person from New Mexico who, who's managing the community health worker initiative at the state level, she said this is a constant conversation. As we move towards standardizing the field, what do we do about people who are already working, who are already effective, who do a great job but don't meet the new educational requirements, okay? What New Mexico has opted to do is to grandfather people and then to, as of a certain date, require new people entering the field to, to meet those requirements. Again, I think it's a, it's a question, and for those of you who are thinking about I'm a behavioral health organization, I want to hire a community health worker, it's an important question, okay? Um, and for those of us who, you who work for health plans, what are you going to require in terms of someone who might get paid as a community health worker? And, and what will allow you to provide some innovation? So just a little sort of um, again, thinking about community health workers working in behavioral health organizations on the one hand, but I think I'm sort of thinking also about community health workers who are working in communities that have experiences of stress in terms of immigration, who have experiences of historical trauma, who have high levels of either mental illness and or substance use disorders, most of the regular certification, as I've talked to people about what's in standardized curriculums for community health workers, again, you have to make a decision. What can we include without this becoming so burdensome people can't go to it? And what isn't in most curriculums is um, a real focus on behavioral health in terms of what is this thing we call depression, what is this thing we call anxiety, and what can I do about it? 
okay? And that's not a criticism of existing curriculums. I don't think there's space to have that in an existing curriculum, but what we're trying to think about at the National Council is, can we support the field by having this, this sort of additional training? And having done this training several times and kind of read the feedback, it seems like it meets a need because what happens is as soon as you go out there and start working, you run into this stuff. You run into people who are really struggling. So just to quickly say, um, and I'm not saying this is the best training on the planet or you know, this is the one that absolutely has to be, but I think it just gives you another idea, particularly for those of you who are thinking about community health workers and behavioral health organizations. If they're working with health homes, they're going to be working with people with serious mental illness and chronic physical conditions, okay? So you probably need to think about what else in terms of on-the-job training are they going to need in order to be able to do that effectively. But for those of you who are working with community health workers who are out in the community, to also think about how might they be helpful in terms of identifying these behavioral health issues in a way that then helps the rest of the team engage differently and intervene differently. So basically, um, what's in the training, and again, these might be topics you might want to think about in terms of your own work with your community health workers is, you know, what is integrated care, what's behavioral health, anxiety and depression, because those are the things that most often are getting in the way of people actually engaging in healthcare and actually moving their outcomes in a positive direction. And then looking at how many physical health issues, you know, like diabetes and depression, they live together. I mean, there are, there's such a correlation between having diabetes and, and having depression at some point in your life. So talking about kind of that and why might that be, issues around how do we work with suicide? How do we assess for it? What do you do if you're a community health worker and you're out there alone and you find out that someone is thinking about killing themselves. So very basics around that. Um, and then how do you develop a self-care plan um, for yourself? Because the work is intense, it's difficult, all of us need that. And then day two really looks at psychosis. How do we intervene? What does that mean in different cultures? How is psychosis identified in different cultures? And then substance use disorders, and then we spend a lot of time in the afternoon of the second day talking about the role of trauma. Not just the role of trauma in terms of a behavioral health issue, but the connection of trauma to physical health issues. And what are some ways that, again, circling back around to the self-care, when you're in a situation where you're hearing these stories over and over and over and you're seeing this over and over, how do you take care of yourself? Yeah. Wait, 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 I have to bring you this. Just kind of as an FYI, we do have a little bit of, of that in our curriculum where we do talk about the mental health, and it's also embedded kind of all the way That's through that, that we're doing it here, and I was wondering if, if um, some of the other curriculums have that or not. So, so what others have told me is they do a, um, I'm trying to think, I talked to five or six people, and what they told me is that they do a touch on what is the community mental health center, I mean, not community mental health center, community mental health system. How do you refer somebody? Why might you refer somebody? When do you refer somebody? And then the other piece that I consider kind of behavioral health is all of the emphasis on therapeutic communi you know, communication, listening skills, motivational interviewing. In that way, it's built all the way through. But in terms of, you know, What's a standardized set of questions you might ask around depression and what might you do if you got these answers? I didn't hear that. Now are you, is that, you're saying that's in? Kind of halfway between the two. Yeah, yeah. But again, I would assume that you have some of that dilemma around how much can we include? Yeah. How much can we include in the basic and then how much do we do as a specialization, not, I'm using specialization in quotes, but you know what I mean. Okay, so um, let me give you some real examples, real world examples. So 
I mentioned Wisconsin earlier, and there's a citation here if you're interested in, in looking at this article. So Wisconsin got a um, SAMHSA grant to look at the role of health educators in primary care, and could they make an impact on um, alcohol use, depression, and tobacco, okay? And so what they did was, this was actually a randomized control trial, believe it or not. I don't, not quite randomized control, but it was almost at that level. So they had 33 sites. They used a variety of levels of health educators, but they put them all through the same training. They had some intense supervision. It was a three-week training. And what they found was that, like I said, the bachelor's level people were better at engagement. Um, the lead investigator told me, he said he thinks that the master's level people knew too much and they couldn't stay focused on what they were supposed to be doing, which made sense to me. But again, if you go back to what I said earlier this morning about effectiveness, I think that sort of gets to how we might think about who do we want to hire and who do we want to use. And that's not to say master's level clinicians, of which I am one, aren't worth something. We are, but, but are we worth, are we... Are we the best approach for this kind of screening environment? Um, and so the other thing is what they found was people's scores on the PHQ-9, which is a standardized measure for depression, improved with the use of the community health worker. And it was interesting because what, they, what people said in the anecdotal feedback was the health educator helped me figure out what I could do differently, OK? So it wasn't necessarily that they changed their medication or they had more psychotherapy, but it was that direct, practical intervention. Um, and they also saw a decrease in alcohol use in people under the age of 65, not so much in people over the age of 65. And the decrease in alcohol use was in that area of people who are at risk meaning they're having more than a certain level of alcohol in a week. The community health worker, the health educator seem to be really helpful in terms of educating people about those risks and engaging them in a plan for decreasing their use of alcohol. Yeah. You mentioned uh, the word in, in your introduction, about uh, stepped care. And I'm thinking that this sounds, sounds like an, an example is. of stepped care. I'm wondering if, if you will talk about that at all. Um, it, it today because it seems to me like that's one of the uh, critical issues that need to be addressed in terms of how to integrate the people working in the community with the formal systems of care. Mm -hmm. and we don't want to get everybody in the formal system. We just want to have that as a, as a uh, resource uh, when, it, when it's needed. Yeah, I, yeah, I think, and, and I'm looking at the clock and, and look, thinking, oh my goodness. So I would say in brief, I think this is, a, like you said, this is a great example of stepped care, which is partly what Rich Brown, who's the lead investigator, was kind of looking at. How do we position, if you think about, I often think about, um, you know, sort of the deep end of care, and then we go out to the edge of the pool. And how do we intervene? So for example, I think using, using a health educator, community health worker to do a basic screening around alcohol use that identifies that here's somebody who's at an at-risk drinking level, okay? They don't need to be referred to specialty care, okay? They need somebody to help them think about changing what's going on. And then to track, are they changing? And if they're not, then we need to re-engage and step it up to the next level. And I think you can use that example in a hundred different ways, um, which I think is what you're, part of what you're getting at. Yeah. And I would also add to that is that we, uh, we, we know uh, from research, but forget about it in practice, that change takes time. Yes. It takes time. And so you can't, just making that referral is, is probably not going to work because it it doesn't allow the passage of time and for the process mm -hmm. to occur. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's, step care offers that potential. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And when you, you would probably be fascinated with this article because one of the things, that, they followed these people for three years um, to see, you know, does the impact continue? Does the impact stay the same? And I think you're right about how do we take into account, 
you know, when you're doing treat to target, you want to see a change, particularly like around depression, you want to see a change on that PHQ-9 score within about 60 days, or else you really ought to think about what do we do differently. And at the same time, we know that that's a long-term process. You can get a short-term remission of the depression, but you still need to have that long-term support. And so how do, we, how do we do that? How do we do that? My contention is most of that can be done in the primary care setting for those lower end kinds of issues. But that we have to think exactly the way you're, where your question is going in terms of least intervention, least restrictive environment, greatest amount of focus needed but not more, and the level of staff that will get improvement. Yeah. So when they followed the, the, uh, this set of people for three years, did they only do an invention, intervention at the front side and then watch to see if the changes Both. were maintained? Both. Or did they continue to have inner contact? Both. So here's what I'm wondering. We're wrapping back to the thing in New York City that I had referenced, their CHWs, um, they, they did an, an interview with a woman who was diabetic and depressed. And what it turned out was that the CHW felt like a companion. She said, I'd see her on the street. It felt like having a friend. And I'm wondering how much of you know, change comes when, when you've got a community worker because you're feeling like you've got either a family member yeah. or a new friend or a companion or a support. Somebody likes you. Somebody's there in the world for you. You're not alone. Yeah, and I think that's really tricky because those of us who work in behavioral health will tell you that that's part of where are you? That's the, my behavioral health friends. That's part of the challenge with case management, right? Am I your friend or am I helping you? You know, and how, how, so at the same time, if you live in the community, there's that natural kind of engagement that happens. <coughs> and I think that's one of the, that's kind of one of the things that we need to think about. I, I also think there are some specific skills that people can be trained in that have an impact. And that's really what this, what this particular study is showing. I don't think we can, that doesn't say the rest of it isn't important, but I think we also have to really look at what are the skills that people need to be trained in and what's the impact we can have. Particularly, I get really passionate around issues of depression, tobacco cessation, and pro risky drinking, because we know if we can head off those three things, we can change people's lives, literally. Um, so a couple other examples. So Bethlehem, P Pennsylvania, a little north of me, they have community health workers. And this, this goes to the funding issue because they're grant funded. So they can only use their community health workers for what the grant will fund, which is smoking cessation, um, smoking cessation, STD screening, and support. So in that situation, what they're finding is that um, those community health workers are also doing a great job at recruitment. As they work at these kinds of issues, they're also working to engage people, get them connected to other levels of care, because again, this is a limited, these community health workers are limited in terms of what they can prescribe. I mentioned San Jose, California, in terms of the peer partners um, and the health navigators. And what the, the project in San Jose is an integrated behavioral health primary care in the primary care setting, okay? So they've got behavioral health providers in the primary care setting. They have a team of community health workers, peer support staff, and recovery specialists working together. And what that team does is all of the non-billable work that goes into a primary care practice. And they fund them partially through grants, partially through, if you're familiar at all with California, they know they have some very interesting funding mechanisms um, around behavioral health because of their 1% tax on millionaires. So it's partly that kind of funding. They've put together a whole different group of, a whole set of funding streams in order to support that model. But I think what's, what's striking to me is that they've really worked at developing that peer team and, and they're very comfortable with the community health worker, the, the peer team is very comfortable with moving back and forth. If someone's really struggling with a behavioral health issue, they'll, the peer support staff will step up. If the real issue is their diabetes, the community health worker will step up. But to the person receiving services, they understand them as a team. And the other thing that's particularly 
I think strong in this model is they've got a real vision around kind of, um, they didn't call it this, this is my language, a community of practice. They bring that team together, they learn from each other, they do group supervision as well as individual supervision. Um, and so, and then there's one of the, um, and, and this particular provider said, don't talk about this publicly yet, Joan, because we haven't worked it out with the state. But in one of your neighbors to the south, one of the prairie states is investigating using community health workers in their health home for the same reason I think that Minnesota is thinking about that because they're seeing that voice at the table, as I said earlier, as particularly critical. And I just want to share so you get to see this beautiful picture of Brandy because I did this, this um, webinar a couple weeks ago and Brandy was on the webinar with me. And for those of you who are from behavioral health, I think this particular story to me really illustrates kind of a developmental trajectory. So five years ago, Valley de Sol, which is in Phoenix, Arizona, was a traditional behavioral health organization. And in six years ago, because in 2010 they took on, they decided to move in the direction of integration. They worked to bring primary care on site. In 2012, they hired their first promotoras. Um, they hi actually hired five of them. In 2014, they became a federally qualified health center lookalike. So they really have moved heavily into this integration space and really see this as the way they deliver all their services. The interesting thing is as they, originally their promotoras were grant funded and as they've moved further down the road toward integration, what they've realized is that they have to have that staff available to them. And so they've made an organizational commitment to continue to secure the funding while they wait for Arizona is moving in the direction of bringing community health workers into their Medicaid plan. And so they think long term that funding will be there. But the other thing that, that I think their story really illustrates for me is Brandy talked pretty clearly on the webinar and in some conversations she and I have had privately about how much having those promotoras on staff have changed the way all of the clinical staff work because they've been able to help the clinical staff around issues where people weren't changing and particularly through the lens of culture. So what is it that's the barrier here to the change and how might we be able to help them? At some very practical levels, it was, it was from Brandy that I heard the story about the tortillas. Um, you know, helping staff understand it's not enough to say to somebody, you have diabetes, this is the kind of diet you need to eat. If you don't understand what food means in their culture and what particular kinds of food mean in their culture, you're, you're with me on that? Yeah, you know, it's not going to work to say to somebody, go eat an 1800 calorie ADA diet. Forget it, it doesn't happen. I'm just using that as one example. Um, so I think it's a great, but, it, but to me it's very striking because it's like you can sort of see this organization growing up and understanding that if we really want to be an integrated group, we've really got to have that community health worker role with us. Just to say about health homes, very quickly, we've been talking about some of this, but if, if I think about, so in a health home, these are the things that you expect to see. If I think about the conversation we've been having this morning around community health workers, I think you can begin to see, so access to care, expanding our workforce, having a team allows us to cover hours of care in a different way, and allows us to have, when I think about access of care as it relates to a community health worker is, you know, my daughter works in a federally qualified health center as a behavioral health consultant. She has community health workers um, as colleagues. And one of the things she said to me is, is that community health worker, her sp Katie's learning Spanish, she's, she's gotten fairly fluent, but she said, in terms of access, that community health worker is the front door for her. That's who brings them in. And then she can actually work with them. So I think that's just a quick example. Engagement, again, if I'm comfortable with you, if I trust you, I'm more likely to be able to engage not only with you, but with the people that you describe as your team members. We call that the transfer of trust. 
you know, I can engage with you, I can develop trust with you, and if you tell me you trust this physician, that's going to help me begin to trust this physician. Um, care coordination, to me, the role of the community health worker in care coordination really is twofold. One is in terms of that navigation through the system, understanding what are the cultural barriers, um, and helping people kind of get through them. You know, that closed glass door when you walk in, that glass screen, we don't think about that as a cultural barrier. In a warm culture, that's a cultural barrier. Community health workers can help with that. And then on the back end, helping people understand what it is that they need to be doing and how they can go about doing it. And we've talked about team. And again, these are the health key health home services in Medicaid health homes under the Affordable Care Act. And most of these we've touched on. I think we've, we've touched a little bit on the whole area of chronic disease management, health promotion, tobacco cessation. Every single one of these, I think there's a place for a community health worker. I've done a lot of work in several states around bringing up the peer workforce in terms of certified peer specialists. And I mentioned earlier that I think some of the issues are similar issues. So for the most part, okay, our healthcare systems are highly professionalized. We value credentials, we value education, and the more letters after your name, the more likely somebody is to get out of the chair when you walk in the room, as you said earlier. That's okay? why I brought it up. Yeah. I think yeah. that's the struggle with community It is the struggle, right? And so then all of a sudden, here comes this new workforce that's coming from a completely different place. And you've got people with all sorts of different kinds of orientation in terms of what gives them their own sense of importance. And you have to then incorporate a whole different kind of way. And let me give you a classic example. I was working with an assertive community treatment team that was bringing peer support staff. This is a very graphic example, OK? But I'm going to use it because I think it gets to the point. They were bringing peer support staff onto their team. And as I was working with them in the run up to this, one of them looked at me and said, you mean they're going to be in our daily meetings? I said, yeah, that kind of is what being part of a team means. And they said, well, how are we going to talk about people if they're here, if he's here in the room? And what that person really meant is, we're not going to be able to talk about people in a derogatory way, OK, in a stigmatizing way. If there's someone in the room who's living with bipolar disorder, it's going to change the way you discuss someone else who's right now having symptoms of mania. I know that sounds really like out there, but I have to tell you I have encountered that particular th that theme in multiple different ways. And it's no different when we bring community health workers in because we're taking dominant culture and bringing in non-dominant culture. And how do we do that as a team? The other issue that I think underlies this whole thing, and, and I can only speak in this way from the behavioral health side. Over the last, I would say, 20 years, the quality of supervision in most behavioral health organizations has fallen off a cliff. Um, and we don't do good supervision. And so when we bring in a workforce that comes in with some strengths and potentially not a lot of experience in the work environment, all of a sudden we say, I told you they couldn't do it. I told you this wasn't going to work. You know, they didn't come to work on time, or they left work early, or they didn't, you know, they didn't wear the right clothes, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When you talk to the other side, what they'll tell you is, they go to lunch and they never invite me. They stop talking when I walk in the room. They treat me like I don't have a brain. They, the communication in their meetings is so fast I can't get a word in edgewise. Okay, So we've got all of these. I mean, on the one hand, you don't think about these as supervision issues. On the other hand, 
this whole area of how do we create a more inclusive culture when we bring in not just different ethnicities but different backgrounds is really at the heart of how do we make a high performing team. And when we think about we're bringing in this workforce to a changing environment. So we're already changing because when we start to bring together physical health and behavioral health, that is a much more radical re-engineering of care than anyone who hasn't done it knows. If you've done it, you know it. But if you haven't, you think, oh, well, that's not so hard. Oh, yes, it is. If we start to do health homes, health homes, the first health home learning community I started working in, I thought, oh, this is not going to be that difficult. I looked at it, I thought, yeah, 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 yeah. And then I really got into it. This is such a radically different way of thinking about the way we've delivered care in behavioral health. Not just thinking about what are the physical health needs, but thinking about, in most states, it comes with um, a bundled kind of payment. You've got to manage the dollar. And you actually have to think about what does the person really need? Talk about step care. What does the person really need rather than how do I drive toward productivity to get the maximum number of visits in so that my bottom line is OK? And I'm not criticizing. That's how businesses survive. But all of a sudden, you're in this different environment. And somebody's looking at your outcomes. And they're real objective outcomes things like blood pressure and hemoglobin A1C. So we're bringing in community health workers in the middle of this major redesign of healthcare. And when we bring this workforce, these workforces in, it helps us, I'm going to say helps because I think this is important, really confront our own internalized stigma. I can tell you that the most transformative at the personal and professional experience of my life was when I was working in Philadelphia, I did storytelling training for people who were living with um, behavioral health issues. And because I was a trainer, not a therapist in that context, I could just sit and listen to about 700 recovery stories. And I have to tell you, what I learned about my own internalized stigma sitting there listening and feeling myself flinch and you know it, it has been really a remarkable process. I have several close friends who have long-term tenure in the behavioral health system who have called me up more than once and it's been a real growth process for me. That same thing is true across ethnic stigma, it's true across class stigma and when we have a more diverse workforce and we're the person who's trying to supervise that, to be aware of that, is really critical. It's a critical component of supervision. And I think what you've just pointed out is that you can't just add one peer specialist or family peer specialist or one community health worker. That's there right. has to be more than one. And your organization has to get ready. There has to be, whether it's cultural competency training or understanding the stigma of mental illnesses, you also have to prepare yes. your workforce to make that happen. Absolutely. You have to do environmental preparation. When we did this right in Philadelphia, we had, in the, when we did environmental preparation, which Philadelphia doesn't do anymore because it's too much time, we had a 75% retention rate at one year of peer support staff. That is unheard of. Okay? But I think, Sue, your point, when we're thinking about bringing community health workers in, how do we create a peer context for them and it may be with other peers, um, but I think that's a really important role in terms of supervision. And the reason I'm putting this in the supervisory world is in piece of this is because this is the stuff behind the scenes that it's hard to talk about. And if you're going to do supervision, you got to think about it and you got to do it. Um, and so I think it's we've talked about dominant, and then this issue of how do we know? Okay, again. We're in a healthcare system that is pushing evidence-based practices. There's some stuff that we don't know yet, okay? Just like, you know, 25 years ago, the evidence-based practice was if you had open heart surgery, you stayed in bed for 24 hours. Now, you're lucky if they let you out of the operating room before they throw you out of bed, okay? The same thing is true in behavioral health and in primary care. We have to be on this journey of working with what we know, working with what we think is working and always looking at is it really working 
and this and then when we bring in this other workforce they're going to have perspectives that are different and how do we listen to that and learn from it because just because it doesn't come with a randomized control trial doesn't mean it isn't true okay and at the same time they have to be able to function in a culture that requires some things of them so how do we help people with that um, and I, as I mentioned before I called that cultural humility so Joan and Sylvia said please 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 we have to have tips okay so um, do you see the word clear on this slide a few times okay I can't <laughs> I know, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, six times, yes. So we don't think about job descriptions a lot. Um, when I had to do my evaluation this year at the National Council, I said to our HR person, do I have a job description? I'm three years in, no, I don't. So we don't necessarily think about job descriptions a lot, but when we're hiring this new workforce, the job description is critical for several reasons. One is it's going to be the touchstone that we help them come back to to understand their role is one way of understanding their role. Second, the way we articulate the role will help us understand how we're really visioning the role. Okay? And so the language we use, the functions we assign, the way we sort of interpret all of that, I would hope that there would be more than one um, version of the job description is what I'm saying. Okay, and getting it really clear, and then supervising to the job description. Because the other place where a lot of people get tripped up, and this is probably more of an issue for behavioral health providers than it is for the rest of you, is we get really therapy-likey. And all of a sudden we've got an employee and we're doing therapy. I'm not saying don't be a supportive supervisor, but I'm saying you gotta, you gotta work to the job description, okay? And the other thing is, I was thinking about this this morning. You know, I have a niece who's wonderful, 25. She's in an MBA program. She's never had a job, ever. She's 25 and she's in an MBA. I'm like, okay, whatever. But I was thinking when she, <laughs> she's brilliant, okay, and she'll be fine eventually. But I was thinking, you know what? When 25-year-old Juliet walks into her first job with her shiny newly minted MBA in international relations. She's going to need a supervisor who teaches her these things, these basic work skills. And any of you who have raised adolescents know that they don't come out of the gate knowing this stuff, okay? No, you can't quit your job because you want to go out on Friday night. You have to give two weeks notice, okay? And I say all that not to say that community, not to be disrespectful at all to this emerging workforce, but because I think sometimes when we're doing supervision, we forget to do a needs assessment. And we, we assume what people know and what they don't know, and we don't find out what they know and what they don't know. Okay? And as I look at it, it's right here where a lot of these relationships fall apart. And it's right here where then we, we blame the person rather than doing what Sue said and looking at what's the environment. What's going on in the environment that might be contributing to this lack of success, okay? And then also being clear about what is my role as a supervisor, which hopefully has something to do with supporting and facilitating your development, yeah. Are there any organizations that you're aware of that are partnering with workforce development organizations to help with bringing this workforce up? Because I'm thinking those are the organizations that, that specialize and have mm -hmm. those skills and have that versus reinventing the wheel and or are there supervision trainings? So how do you supervise a developing and emergency, emerging workforce. Mm. Yeah, there are supervisory training. We actually have one. I'm not trying to market it, but we actually have one, um, specifically around the peer workforce, which was developed around peer support staff and recovery specialists, but is going to quickly be revised to include this workforce. I've been thinking about that over the last couple weeks. I'm not aware, yeah, I thought you might have a, that would be your role, right? <laughs> 
Well, um, I'd like to recognize uh, Angie Gerlach from Southside uh, Health Services. Angie, you want to stand up uh, just so everybody can see you? Angie co-chairs the Minnesota CHW Alliance CHW Supervisors Roundtable. So many supervisors just haven't had a lot of experience with this workforce. So the goal, uh, among the goals of the roundtable um, are to um, share uh, challenges, share successes, be able to grow as C CHW uh, supervisors to improve uh, in that supervisory role, to be able to address many of these, these challenges that uh, Joan has uh, so articulately uh, described. Um, because uh, there's a need to be able to explain the role to other team members, to other departments. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's an ongoing, <laughs> ongoing uh, work in progress. But just to know that we have this, this group available, and for more information, you could talk to Angie. Since I had a total brain meltdown, thank you for rescuing me because I talked about this work in Minnesota on the national webinar because I was so impressed with it because I do think, I think training will partially get you there, but I think that kind of group environment is critical because that's where you can really test, you know, test out your thinking, test out your ideas. Um, and I think, you know, the fact that you've really invested in that is one of the real strengths I see here in Minnesota because it's not something that a lot of places do. I was thinking just in terms of an example of workforce development in, in Philadelphia, the Mental Health Association of Southeastern Pennsylvania holds one of the two approved peer support trainings, um, peer specialist trainings. And so they do partner with organizations and they actually run the supervisors um, support group for peer specialist supervisors in the city of Philadelphia and the surrounding counties. So I think partnering in that way, like in this case with your Community Health Worker Alliance or with, with an organization, you know, it could also be some of your training programs would be a really great resource for that. A um, couple other things, just clear team leadership. And again, we, because of all the cultural issues that go on, where I've seen this work beautifully is when the, the supervisor is courageous. I think, you know, the shadowing, modeling, creating a learning space. So, you know, that um, see, do, teach, that kind of model, using that model in supervision with this workforce is particularly helpful. Performance evaluations in a strength-based way regularly, not once a year. You know, I, um, Last year, when the National Council has their conference, I rarely get to go to anything that they do because I'm running around making sure everybody's getting what they need. But last year, I got to hear this woman named Holly Green talk about some of her work with corporations. And she talked about a corporation that has monthly performance updates. And it's not that, oh my gosh, it's the evaluation or, oh, what a waste of time evaluation. It's the, this is where you said you wanted to get to this year. How are you doing? How am I doing as your supervisor? What else do you need from me? And how are you doing in terms of the things that you wanted to be able to do? And then raising diversity issues and learning. Oh, recognizing three worldviews in every encounter. Um, and that we all learn our professional identity through socialization. And this is a good thing and a bad thing. So on the one hand, you want to be socializing people into the culture of the work environment. On the other hand, you don't want to be co-opting them. And so how do you, if you go way back to that definition I gave you, that aspirational definition from the World Health Organization of what the power of the community health worker's role is, how do you help them, as a supervisor, how do you help them learn to function in the dominant culture and not lose the power that comes from their own culture? Now we're going to uh, spotlight a couple of programs here in Minnesota that um, apply CHW strategies uh, uh, to address the needs of, of people with uh, behavioral health conditions. Uh, so uh, our original panel was to include three individuals. One of them, Jean Gunderson from Mayo Clinic, came down with the flu. She can't be here today, but her presentation is in your handout uh, in, in the packet. So I do commend that to you. Jean Gunderson at Mayo is leading a, a wonderful CHW program there. 
were in, um, uh, in, a, in a joint supervisory model with Intercultural Mutual Assistance Association, a community-based organization in Rochester. And among the variety of roles that the CHW team <coughs> plays there is uh, working with patients in the Diamond Project. Uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, Diamond uh, in terms of addressing depression in primary care settings, primarily through a telephonic uh, model. So CHWs there, as you'll see from her presentation, play a role in home visits and really take that, that model another step, uh, deepen it in terms of getting uh, better outcomes for, for Diamond patients. Uh, so I'm very pleased to have on our panel today uh, in person Linda Berglin, uh, who will address uh, the improved outcomes for correctional clients through a CHW model at Hennepin County Jail that's getting underway. And I'm also very pleased to have Eva Sebesta, a community health worker uh, with uh, the Northern Lights uh, Mental Health Clubhouse in Ely. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to uh, turn it over to, uh, to Linda. Uh, what we'll, we'll plan here is to have 10-minute uh, presentations uh, or so by, uh, by Linda and by Eva with Q&A following each. And I'll just run around and, and uh, if any of you have questions after their present, each presentation, just raise your hand. Um, again, we want this to be a highly interactive and very helpful session to all who come today. Thank you. Uh, so some of you used to know me when I was at the legislature, but uh, for a little over three years now I've been at Hennepin County. I do a lot of work with Hennepin Health, and, um, and this project has come about because of discussions uh, that we've had at Hennepin Health, although it's not just for the Hennepin Health population. So... <clears throat> Uh, my first slide says improved outcomes for correctional clients and accountable community for health. And I am happy to tell you that we were awarded today. The governor announced that we were awarded one of the SIM Accountable Community for Health grants. So <clears throat> we will have all the tools we need to do the kind of job we want to do with this population. So this population is at risk. Next slide. Um, there's a high number of homeless among this population, high number of unemployed people, a high number of people who are disconnected from community health and are using costly crisis health care. We have a high number with behavioral health needs, a high number of minorities facing health disparities. So why are we surprised that we also have a high number of people who are returned to custody? It's like about 74% each year that are returned. It's kind of the definition of insanity, you know. So we're, we're thinking we should do something different here. And uh, <clears throat> one of the first things that we did is to look at um, what people who are in the jail say they would like. We asked them, we did a survey of everybody in the jail over one weekend in February, and we said to them, if you could receive services in the jail to help you succeed when you get out, what would they be? And we had 60% who asked for housing services. <clears throat> a little over 50% said they'd like employment services. We had 44% who said they needed help to enroll in health insurance. That was a, a surprise. Um, we, we had a little over 41% say they needed financial assistance. 29, a little over 29% said they had mental health concerns. A little over 29% said they had concerns with alcohol use. Another 25% said they, they had concerns about substance uh, abuse. And a little over 33% said they'd like to find out more about how to finish an education or get a GED. So we were pretty excited about those results. We have an audience that's 
anxious to receive services that we would like to give them. <clears throat> so we received a grant from the Department of Health um, for the emerging professional um, and uh, our emerging professional was a CHW to work in the jail. This person will be joining a team of other people. So there will be social workers from Hennepin County, Rule 25 assessors, eligibility technicians to help people sign up for programs, health navigators to help people sign up for insurance. And the community health worker as a part of this team will be providing up to 90 days of service to approximately 600 clients per year um, to help get them connected with healthcare services in the community. We are targeting our behavioral health clients because there are thousands of people that go through the jail every year. There's an average length of stay in the jail of four days, so this is not like we have <coughs> a long time to get acquainted with people and work with them. But we believe that people that, for whom we get appointments, we will be following up to see that if they kept the appointment. If not, can we get them another appointment, help them have transportation to that appointment? And um, so um, the clients will keep turning over during a year. We will also be connecting clients to health insurance, housing, uh, treatment services, mental health services, and employment supports. So this is part of our correctional community in Hennepin County, those that are at the jail. We also have an adult corrections facility, otherwise known as the workhouse. And um, our plan at the workhouse is to connect with clients who have previously been connected to Hennepin Health. At the jail, it's gonna be everybody with a behavioral health issue who wants our service. At the adult corrections facility, we have a community health worker who's going out there now as well. Um, she is out there two half days a week. She is there in, conjun in conjunction with an employment specialist so we're working with people to help talk about planning for employment and we're working and talking with people about planning for health care transition. We want people to have appointments at the time of their discharge so they can maintain their medications and uh, make sure that their other health care needs are being met. We will also be providing to our correctional clients at the adult corrections facility with this grant that we will be receiving housing resources. And that has been our missing link. It is really difficult to stay connected to these clients when they are discharged into homelessness. So we hope we will have improved outcomes for our correctional clients. We believe the program that we are working on with our community health workers will reduce substance use and mental health symptoms, will reduce the number of arrests people experience, will reduce the amount of unemployment and homelessness, reduce the number of hospitalizations people experience and emergency department visits, and reduce the number of treatment episodes people are experiencing. We want to increase the coordination of health and social services we want to um, enroll people in social services supports. We want to see their income increase and their well-being increase. And we want to see them develop a support system among their peers to help support themselves in their recovery. We will be evaluating both the program in the jail and our program at the workhouse. And we will be um, Evaluating the reduction in recidivism, reduction in shelter use, uh, the reduction in the number of uninsured, the reduction in hospital and emergency department use. We will be measuring to see if there is an increase 
in uh, treatment for behavioral health needs taking place outside of the correction setting. We'll, we'll be watching to see if people are enrolled in social service supports that will help them on a path toward independence. And we will be watching to see how many people get employment or training from the program. We have a program currently for our Hennepin Health Behavioral Health clients that provides them with employment supports. And I am here to tell you that for those that we have gotten jobs, we are saving over $800 per member per month once they get a job. So we're pretty excited about the potential that this corrections population project has because we see them as being very similar, um, very similar characteristics to the population that we have been serving already. So with that, I'm going to stop and see if you have questions and hope you share our excitement. Uh, Linda, w one, one question I have has to do with the outcomes you expect. You talked sort of reduced uh, ER and hospitals use of hospitals, and I'm wondering with these, these people where they often have deferred health care needs, that they, they've had them for a while, uh, and w once they get plugged into a system, they start actually uh, have an opportunity to get health care. I'm wondering uh, how, that, uh, how you'll address that uh, when you look at your statistics, because it seems like some of the um, hospital use might be very appropriate. Well, yes, when hospital use is appropriate, we want people to use the hospital. But what we see going on with this population today is that they're using the hospital and the emergency room for crisis care. They're not getting the preventative care. They're going in when they're having symptoms, when they're having a crisis going on, and um, we would like them to learn to use primary care and the healthcare home as the way they prevent those things from happening in the future. We, we think very few of them are connected to health care homes. And um, so we know once we can do that, that then people do receive preventative services. And oftentimes, they're able to be taken care of outside of the hospital setting. I was wondering if you could just talk in a little bit about what the community health workers do. I saw that you had one community health worker for 600 people and that made me nervous for that poor individual. So I was just curious like what you're expecting that person to do. Well we expect them to be in the jail connecting people with behavioral health issues to health care appointments, both primary care and behavioral health appointments. And in some cases it might be getting them a placement in treatment, in other cases it might be trying to get them into a mental health clinic, um, and then following up with them to make sure when they leave the jail that they do actually get to the appointment. And if they don't get to the appointment, you know, rescheduling that appointment and trying to stay connected with the person for up to 90 days. So the people that are being served keep turning over. So the 600 is for the whole year. Oh, it's not 600 at a time. Right. <laughs> Take a deep breath. It's okay. <laughs> once, they're, once they're with their primary care clinic or their mental health clinic, then we expect that the community health worker at that site will take over the care coordination role. Got it. Okay. Thanks. How, how does one get connected to a community health uh, worker? It, in this program? Did, is it through like a referral process or? Well, in the jail, we are, uh, we are conducting a brief assessment to try to determine if people have behavioral health needs. We're using the jail uh, health care staff to also help us identify those people. Sometimes people self-disclose that they've been on medication so they can continue the medication while they're in the jail. Um, so uh, we have a number of ways of identifying clients who might be eligible to receive services. And um, you know, our real challenge is that they're there for such a short time. So 7.30 in the morning, you know, the staff, the team gets a roster of people who are in there who weren't in there yesterday. And they run like crazy trying to find them before they, because some of them will be going off that same day 
to the court and they might not be coming back to jail. So it's really, um, you know, when people are there a little bit longer, then it's a little easier, but we never know if they're gonna be there longer or not. So we're, we're chasing them as fast as we can every day to find them and make connections with them. Now at the adult corrections facility, that's different. We get a roster every month, I mean every week, of people that have been admitted who have previously had insurance with Hennepin Health. And we contact those people to see if they're interested in receiving health care planning services for when they leave and employment services for when they leave. And we meet with those people a number of times. We, uh, ideally, we'd like to meet with them six times before they're discharged to work on the planning and to work on communication and, and work on really getting connected so that we can continue that connection after they're discharged. One of the many things that uh, I think is exemplary about Hennepin Health is um, how you talk to your clients to find out what your needs are. Um, I think there's a tendency for folks to, uh, in systems to try to problem solve, and that's very good, but obviously talking to the people who um, the, in, in your target population is key to really understanding what their needs are and how to design services that are going to help them. Um, so that's, that's fabulous, and I think your focus on the social determinants of health really comes through in, in your model, and that's, that's so very important as well, and a much higher priority in our state of Minnesota um, uh, by virtue of the work from the health department and others. Um, but I'm, I'm interested to hear a little bit about what you look for in a CHW to um, uh, uh, address the behavioral health needs of clients in the Hennepin County Jail and you know we know that CHWs they bring their attributes they bring their um, shared life experience their knowledge of their communities and their training to their roles so uh, interested to hear from you um, what what are your priorities in terms of um, hiring um, uh, recruiting a CHW for this particular um, role with uh, Hennepin County Jail clients Okay, so sure, we're, we're just in the process of getting the position approved by the board, so we haven't hired anybody for the position at the jail yet. We don't think we're going to find somebody with experience doing that because this is pretty new and, you know, there aren't CHWs in the jails around Minnesota. Um, so we'll be looking for people that maybe have um, been working with clients who have behavioral health issues. Um, We'll be looking for uh, somebody who can be part of a social services team. Um, that'll be more of their team peers than medical, although obviously at the jail we do have medical staff. Um, our CHW that goes out to the workhouse is, um, we have a number of, of CHWs who do outreach, and this is one of our outreach CHWs. And um, so this is somebody that's interested in working with people who are not very connected to healthcare and trying to get them connected and trying to let them know how important it is. We have epic medical records in both the jail and the workhouse so people can see if they're being treated for an illness while they're in the, in the correction facility and follow up with them to talk about, well, how are you going to get your diabetes taken care of when you leave? Do you have any appointments set up? Do you have a regular clinic that you've been going to before you came here? Um, so, th you know, our, our community health workers that are doing outreach are really trained and connected to listening um, interviewing skills um, and working to try to get people connected who have not traditionally been connected. I'm curious if you can define a little bit more, describe a little bit more the follow-up once they leave the jail or leave the workhouse. You know, there's more and more um, focus in many funding streams um, uh, about trying to f assess the outcomes and the impact of our work, you know, by following up once they leave our direct environments so you know whether that's cell phone or email or telephone or site visits or you know what 
how do you see that connection functioning? How do you see the mandate for that connection? How does the client see the mandate for that connection? And then physically, how is it done? Well, the program that we have at the workhouse today, the weakest link in the whole thing is that people are being discharged to homelessness way more often than we'd like. You know, they tell us things like, yeah, I'm going to go live with my sister. Well, that works out for about four days, and the sister doesn't want them there, and so then they're not at the sister's, and then we can't, we can't find them. So that's why we're so excited about the SIM grant that we were just announced uh, today, because we will have money in there for short-term housing and um, helping people to locate permanent, ongoing, affordable housing. And so we think that will help us a lot to, more to stay connected with people. We are considering for our program at the jail, at least for Hennepin Health clients, you know, giving them prepaid cell phones so that our community health worker can stay connected to them. Um, and we also work very closely with um, Health Care for the Homeless. Our Health Care for the Homeless clinics are located in our um, homeless shelters and they're located in our drop-in centers for people who are homeless. So. Uh, coordinating with them to help us find people if they're being discharged to a shelter. Are you expecting your CHW then that they will physically go there to connect with those people? What your vision for that, mm -hmm. you know, to... Well, for the jail, we're not expecting somebody to go visit people, um, at least at this point in time, because we only have one CHW. Um, but for the workhouse population, yes. Once we have located them in the temporary housing, then we do expect that there will be visits to them at those sites. Good questions, Rebecca. Thank you. Eva, we'd love to hear from you now. Uh, well, my name's Eva Sebesta, and I am associated with Wellbeing Development, uh, and it uh, is, has a program of Northern Lights Clubhouse, and I'll be talking a little bit more about those. Uh, some of the things that I'd like to share with you this morning, uh, some details about uh, Ely, Minnesota, which is that little uh, town up on the edge of the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. Uh, a bit more on the Northern Lights Clubhouse, our community <laughs> care team, uh, some of the things that we're doing as community health workers in Ely, uh, some grants that have been really supportive to our, our community health worker positions, and then what we're doing uh, in the future. And Ely is a really small rural community up in the northeastern corner of Minnesota, and we have a population of about 3,500 people, but that really doesn't give the full picture of Ely because we really are a, a service area to a much larger uh, group of people, and it's uh, over 12,000 people that Ely services. And 25.5% of the population is <laughs> below poverty level compared to the statewide average of about uh, 15%. And so there's, there's quite a difference there um, with our rural community. And um, 8,932 uh, people receive services through Ely Essentia Health. 17% uh, of those individuals have been diagnosed with one or more mental illnesses. And that's really a high number when you compare it to the nationwide of about 6%. Uh, when we look at the population versus mental health providers, um, looking at the two counties that Ely services, which is St. Louis and Lake County, uh, St. Louis County has a ratio of 688 people per one mental health provider. Lake County has uh, 2,761 residents per mental health provider, but we're literally at the end of the road. We don't have full-time uh, on staff mental health providers at either our clinic or our hospital. The closest location is Virginia, Minnesota, which is 60 miles, and some of our residents do go there. Uh, other residents that need mental health support will also go to Duluth, Minnesota, which is 120 miles away. Now, a, a really large challenge that we have faced is that many of the individuals that need mental health support don't have their own mode of transportation. And within the town of Ely, uh, we have a, a 
Ely Public Transit that runs two to three days a week for a few hours a day within the town of Ely. That same transit provides uh, transportation to Virginia one, one day a month, but the catch is they have to get enough people to sign up for the transit. So if you have your doctor visits scheduled, you may or may not get to see them uh, depending on if the shuttle goes or not. And so the transportation has been a really huge piece for us and Northern Lights Clubhouse and some other nonprofit organizations have been really working to address this. And one of the things that we were able to do is identify a, a private contractor in Ely that's willing to start doing five days a week uh, transportation within Ely and then multiple shuttles to Virginia and Duluth. So we're gonna help with that connectivity piece. Uh, in 2008, there was a group of uh, community members that got together and really started having some serious conversations about the la lack of mental health support in Ely. And in 2010, this group uh, formally organized into Wellbeing Development, which is a 5013C organization. And that group started really looking at the different programs available nationwide. And in 2011, they uh, launched what's called Northern Lights Clubhouse. And to give you a little bit more information on clubhouses, it's an international movement and there's over 330 clubhouses in 33 different countries worldwide. So this is a huge movement and it is growing every day. Uh, the clubhouse model is a program that's recognized by the National Registry of Evidence-Based Programs and Practices. And the clubhouse model is really designed to support uh, it's participants which are called members. They're not patients, clients, um, but they're members in uh, skill development, uh, educational training, and also uh, employment opportunities. And one of the newest things that has been happening with the clubhouse movement is Northern Lights Clubhouse isn't the only clubhouse in the state of Minnesota. There's Vail Place in Hopkins, there's Vail Place in Minneapolis, there's Second Step in Mankato, and in all there's 11 different clubhouses across the state and we formed a coalition uh, in April to really start working together, networking. We're hoping to be able to work on large federal uh, grants together, uh, and then also just mental health advocacy overall. In 2012, uh, a group of service providers got together and they applied for and received a clinical and transitional uh, science institute grant. And that grant really helped to form what we call the Ely Community Care Team. And there's about 20 active service providers that make up a, a wide range of, in, of organizations in the community. It's our local school districts, the community college, the clinic, the hospital, um, just all uh, different groups that are interested in creating a team-based um, community uh, type uh, care system and it, the idea behind it is that if everybody is talking together and working together and communicating across agencies that we're going to provide much better uh, support to individuals that are getting services. Now part of that CTSI grant also included funding for two part-time health, community health worker positions as well as the certification and Heidi Favitt is the first community health worker that was certified in our community and she works through Ely Essentia Health and her official title is a, a, a care coordinator and she also is the team leader for the community care team and she does a phenomenal job and then I was the second individual that was certified and I do a lot of my work through the Northern Lights Clubhouse. Uh, now, a second grant that's been really beneficial to me is the Minnesota Department of Health Emerging Professions Grant, and we are, were awarded that in July of this year, and this has been really helpful, and uh, you can obviously see that I was really excited because it expanded my position to full-time, and I mentioned that twice, uh, <laughs> but... It, it really has been great because it is allowing me to do more not only within the clubhouse but really to expand into the community and I'll talk about that in just a minute. And some of the things that we're doing as uh, community health workers in Ely, uh, we really work with 
uh, individuals and, and helping them identify their health and wellness goals um, so that they can move forward in their recovery. And some of those things can include just consistently taking their medications and maybe it is consistently taking their medications for a month uh, or creating an exercise program or overcoming an unhealthy behavior um, that has been a challenge for them. We also help with different facets of medical appointments, uh, work with the different service providers, and then we're also advocates. And like the transportation piece, we were consistently seeing that individuals were having problems getting to medical appointments in Ely and in some of the Virginia, Duluth, and other areas. And so we really started trying to figure out how we could uh, address that. And then paperwork is also uh, a huge monster um, because sometimes you have really lengthy forms and things like that, and it can be pretty daunting. And so we help with various aspects of that. So within the clubhouse, um, as a community health worker, I do a lot of the, that same individual one-on-one -on -one work, but I also work more in a group setting, and there's really three areas that I've tried to focus on, and one is creating uh, educational programming to meet member needs, because a clubhouse is member-driven, and what that looks like is members identify the needs that they have and that, that they would like to have met, and then we work together collectively to try to find um, educational um, pieces and support and things like that that will help them uh, as they're moving with their recovery. And one of the things that members identified is that um, they need help with healthy, healthy cooking. Um, there's all sorts of stuff at the food shelf, but what the heck do you do with dry beans? And so uh, we do a lot of food preparation to, to show how to make those healthy, easy uh, meals. And it's members that are doing the teaching as well as me. Uh, we also do t tutoring and education uh, and then development of life skills. Uh, so like things like conflict resolution is uh, something that we've talked about. And employment is a huge part of the, the clubhouse model. And, uh, so providing that, that pre-employment training and supports uh, some individuals haven't worked for 20 years. And so it can be really overwhelming to think about going into an interview and so um, doing mock interviews and working together that way. And probably the, the biggest piece is just reducing isolation and uh, offering a place that's safe and positive uh, that that individuals can come into, uh, no stigma, no judgment. They're just accepted where they're at and who, they're, who they are. And so that's a really huge part. And in looking to the future, some of the things that we're gonna be doing is, uh, I'm gonna be going to the HRA housing complexes in Ely starting next week and being there at set times. And the idea is to create a better level of accessibility for residents. Um, some you know, sometimes in the, the winter when you've got limited transportation, um, mobility challenges, uh, seven months of cold, it, it's really easy to isolate. So we're gonna try going to where folks are at. And they can come in, talk about whatever needs they have, and then work to meet those needs. Uh, we just had RAP training, which is Wellness uh, Recovery Action Plan. And so we're going to be doing our first mental health uh, support group. And that's going to be starting in a few weeks. Uh, taking some of those educational programs that are being developed in the clubhouse and then taking them out into the community based on what the community needs are is another aspect. And then uh, the Ely Community Care Team just received a, a SIM grant. I don't have a lot of details other than we're getting another full-time community health worker, which is awesome because we definitely have the need. And if I can leave two thoughts with you, um, the Ely Community Care Team has really been beneficial with creating that, that team-based coordinated care. And community health workers are really kind of a, a piece or a, a center part of that coordinated care because we see the big picture of what um, individuals' needs are. And sometimes those service providers are seeing just one little snippet of, of the need. And so we really kind of help to make that, that quilt 
uh, with all the pieces together to, to give them the best support possible. So the, the ultimate goal is to empower individuals to live healthier lives, and I think that coordinated care really does that. Questions for Eva? Uh, Eva, did you say how long the positions are going to be funded through these grants? Uh, the Emerging Professionals grant that I just received is uh, going to fund my position all the way through the end of next July. Uh, the CTSI grants have already um, uh, ended, uh, and then the newest grant that they've received, I think, will go, uh, it, it'll be 12 months. It hasn't quite started yet. <coughs> So any thoughts about uh, how to sustain the community health workers? That, that, uh, that's a, a huge thought. <laughs> and uh, w up in our area, we don't have any type of county funding that is, is uh, coming in for the community health workers. And we haven't gotten to the point. I, I think they're just starting at Essentia Health to do the billing portion, uh, but we haven't gotten that. Uh, in at Northern Lights Clubhouse yet, and so we're at the clubhouse we're really relying a lot on private donations and grants. Um, United Way has been a great uh, source of, of funding for uh, the clubhouse and in the community health worker position. Any other questions for Eva? Yes. I know there's been some discussion about providing uh, mental health services in rural areas through telehealth mm -hmm. and that Essentia has been part of that you know movement to do more and more use, using telehealth. Um, has there been any discussion in your community about that? Yep, they have just started doing that and that is really a good piece particularly um, a lot of the, the mental health providers are uh, doing that from Duluth and so that's helping with that transportation piece as well. Um, one thing I'd like to add, we talked a little bit about sustainability. David, you asked that very important question, how can we sustain this work? Um, and uh, as, as Joan King mentioned, here in Minnesota, we do have uh, Medicaid payment for CHW certificate holder patient education services that can include mental health. So while it's not the totality of the role, it's an important slice of the role for those of you in the room to be aware of. So today, here and now, we have a payment stream available to CHWs that are uh, conducting patient education, whether it's in the home, in the clinic, in a community mental health center, in the community, in the hospital, many different settings. So please be aware of that. Um, we have uh, conducted a webinar on that uh, just yesterday, and we'll be posting that information uh, through a microsite that we'll have, a couple microsites we'll have up after the first of the year. So that's great information, and Minnesota Department of Human Services is the resource on, on that payment. Um, uh, so just, just be aware of that. I'd also like to recognize the role of um, our panelist, Linda Berglund. When she was in the Senate, she played a key role in the passage of that legislation. So um, very much appreciate her role in the um, growth of, of this workforce here in, in Minnesota. And one of the reasons why we wanted to convene this group um, and focus on this program is we recognize that CHWs are really underutilized here in Minnesota, that we have an infrastructure uh, that is nationally recognized, but there are so many more places that CHWs could be employed and, and make the difference that you're hearing about and be able to tap into the payment um, mechanism that is currently available and one that we want to continue to improve. So that is one of the uh, reasons for bringing you all together today as we look at rolling out behavioral health homes next year, the role that CHWs can play on the behavioral health home teams. Um, really exciting to hear about some of the models that Joan King talked about uh, it, with peer teams um, and, and those potential. Uh, so any other questions uh, for our panel here? Hi, so as you mentioned, the current payment for um, CHWs is for uh, health education. Are there any efforts underway to expand the areas where 
um, CSWs could be paid. One of the things I'm, I'm hearing of within the panel is care coordination. There are, there are many other things that, that could be done, but currently we don't have a way to pay for that. The Alliance, working with our many members, including CHW employers, and of course we always work with CHWs in anything that we do, has been identifying some areas that um, we'd like to bring forward to the Minnesota Department of Human Services to improve and expand um, services that could be covered, uh, delivered by CHWs within the CHW scope of practice. Because again, here in Minnesota, we actually have developed a, a scope of practice that defines really the parameters of the role. Um, so, so the answer to your question is yes, but we would love to work with others on this. And so if any of you would like to um, come together with us on this or any other of the um, themes that have been talked about this morning on supervision, for instance, or recruitment, or onboarding CHWs, um, or even just thinking creatively about the many more places CHWs could be employed, especially in behavioral health, as behavioral health homes roll out, um, we'd love to work with you. We're very inclusive. Anyone who uh, attends a meeting is a member, so, um, so please uh, uh, you know, uh, introduce yourself to me at the end of the meeting, and we'd love to add you to our listserv and, and uh, hear more about what you'd like to work on, too. But Trudy, is there anything you'd like to suggest that, you'd, uh, that has come to your mind around um, services that um, could, could be potentially covered or should we should look at? Uh, I, I'm, I'm hesitating to say anyone because um, I think there are, are many. Um, for me, it's a, it's a change in terms of uh, the relationship. Um, so rather than a provider-patient type of relationship, it's, a, um, uh, it's taking into account cultural aspects, it's taking into account the whole person rather than just a specific condition that they may have. And so in that context, I see the community health worker as providing a way to address um, more fully the needs of the individuals. And so would like to have um, reimbursement for that role reflect the complexity of the care that they can provide. Well, I hope that, uh, Trudy, you'll, <laughs> you'll uh, join with us, because I think you expressed that so very, so very well. I think that we're working within um, the, the um, guidelines and rules of medical assistance, um, which is a, a medical insurance program, vis-a-vis uh, -vis a, a role that's, that's broader than that, and um, yet can really make a difference, as, as we've heard. And I think it's our hope in the future that ACO models and accountable communities for health under payment reform will give us a lot more latitude to integrate CHW models more totally and to support those models because they're going to get us to the metrics uh, that we need to, that we know that what happens in that short office visit, that 10 to 15 minutes or maybe 30 minutes is is not going to get us to the outcomes that we need. So uh, CHWs can can help contribute to those those better outcomes and, and this broader focus around the social determinants of health. We have just a couple more minutes here. Any more questions? Well, we're going to, and let me ask uh, our panelists, do you have some final comments yeah. you'd like to I make? Just, say just just to what, what you just said, because I, I think this may be my, um, my hopeful, optimistic side speaking, so forgive me if it is, but I'm going to say I'm a pragmatic optimist. But I think the work that you're doing, the conver kind of conversations you're having here this morning, and, and these two programs, and then all the others around the state, are so important because what you have that a lot of places don't have is because you've got the CHW Alliance and you've got the Supervisors Roundtable, you've got, you've got the possibility to collect metrics from some of these programs. You've got the ongoing kind of um, organic development of understanding and role that happens when the supervisors all get together and you begin to hear those themes emerging, and I just know you're tracking all those themes all the time, right? Writing them all down, great. 
because I think as we move more and more into more of a, you know, a values-based environment where organizations go at risk, as opposed to, you know, in this more dependent fee-for-service kind of environment. I think collecting the kind of information you're getting from all your innovation projects then puts you in a position to be able to do what you just said, which is to say, don't make us count widgets. Tell us where you want to get, and then let us develop a team that's going to get us there, and we're accountable to you for getting there not for how we get there. And I don't mean, therefore, you can commit fraud and abuse. I don't mean any of that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about that then you're, you have the potential to do, you know, to develop that step care model and that population-based model and to say, you know, these people can be served best by a heavy hit on community health worker and a light, I shouldn't say hit, I try not to use military language, but a heavy dose of community health worker and a lighter dose of master's level therapist or psychiatrist or physician or nurse practitioner. These people, they really need that. And so that frees up the community health worker. So all that is just to, to say, I, I come to the way from today really excited by all of the things you're doing and by the fact that there is there's a, if you want to use this language, there's a caretaker, in essence, which is your organization, to capture it all, to then put you in a position to negotiate as the financial environment continues to shift. And the partnership, I think, with the Department of Health is critical because the Department of Health in some states is not at the table. You know, they are on high handing down rather than saying, let, let us learn together. And I think that's a really critical, another asset that you all have here.